You are now listening to the Music Business Dreams podcast, brought to you by KDMR Music. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in once again to the Music Business Dreams podcast. I'm your host, Brandon, from KDMR Music. Now, if this is your first time here, we interview artists, managers, and people all over the music industry to inspire our next generation of artists and music industry professionals. Uh, So, Hope you get something great out of today's interview. And now before we get into that interview, a couple of things I want to uh, talk about really quickly. Uh, So last week, right after uh, our podcast episode went live, BeatStars got hacked. So if you are a music producer or if you're a rapper, you've probably heard of BeatStars. It's a website where music producers will sell or lease their beats or their, you know, instrumental tracks to artists, to rappers, singers, who are looking for tracks. And so if you're someone who buys beats from that website, you've probably noticed it's harder to find them right now. It's because their website got hacked. So if you are a music producer, which I know a lot of people in our audience are, uh, you're going to want to check out a video I did on our YouTube channel, uh, just breaking down some ways that you can protect yourself. And then also how in the future, you can prevent something like this from having a huge impact on your business. Uh, there are a lot of producers that I know in some Facebook groups that I'm in who were complaining that, you know, BeatStars have been down for days. Um, I'm not sure if they're all the way back up and running uh, even as we speak. But there were producers that were complaining about how, you know, they're, they're missing out on money. And, you know, that's always going to be something that's kind of a trade off when you decide to use one of these bigger platforms. Obviously, they provide the reach, but most of them also control the full supply chain, meaning they control the transaction. So if that website goes down, then in most cases, your business is down. So there are things you want to be doing to protect yourself while you are. Uh, operate and do business on those websites. Uh, So I did a video breaking down how you can make sure you still own the relationship with your customers so that you can stay in touch with them when things like this happen. Uh, So if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, you can go to kdmr.us slash YouTube and check out that video. And there's about 50 other videos on the channel that uh, you can browse at your leisure. Uh, Now, Thank you to everyone who has signed up for our group coaching program. Uh, It is no longer untitled. It is called The Next Steps. And that's because simply we're helping you take the next steps in your music career. Uh, You know, you've got some songs together. You maybe you've been doing this for a little while, but you haven't been able to gain traction. So we're going to tell you the next steps that you need to take to make your music career or make your music hobby a serious business, and then we'll teach you the marketing skills you need to develop that business and grow it. So uh, there are only 10 spots available for this first go round of the course. It is going to be an eight week uh, live training in our fa- in a private Facebook group. So if you are interested in being one of those 10 people, then you need to go to kdmr.us slash next steps. That is N-E-X-T. S-T-E-P-S. And uh, I'm just like killing myself because I've got a whistle when I talk. So that was the worst. Why did I name it that? <laughs> but um, so if you're interested in that program, check out the link. It'll be in the show notes. And that way you can sign up for your spot. The spots are only $50 for this first go round. Once the program is launched to the public, those spots will be $200 each. And again, I'm only accepting 10 members. So those spots are going to go super quickly. If you have not signed up yet, again, the link is in the show notes and you can sign up. Uh, Registration is going to close on December 31st or whenever it fills up. So, again, check back. You'll see how many spots are left when you click on that link. Um, And the class starts on January 7th. I'm really excited to meet all of you guys. I know uh, there's a few of you that have already signed up. So I'm excited to get to know you guys over that eight week program and really start 2019 off in the right direction uh, with all the knowledge and the training that you're going to get learning from me as well as each other. Uh, So with 
without further ado, I want to get into today's guest. Now, I do have to apologize. I was doing some cleaning, organizing files on my hard drive, and I realized that I deleted my side of the audio for today's interview. So you're only going to hear the phone. I mean, again, you'll hear me talking, but uh, it's not the nice, crispy voice you'll you usually hear on the show. Uh, but that's OK, because the content was amazing. And so uh, our guest today is Patrice K. Coakley. Now, Patrice is a music business coach. She is a marketing consultant and a college professor. She's the owner of the Baseline Group, which is a talent management company where she develops and manages the careers of music creatives and professionals. She holds a bachelor's as well as a master's degree in marketing, and she teaches music business and marketing at the SAE Institute in Chicago. In addition to all of that, she's a brand ambassador for Lux Footwear, and she's also the product and education specialist for Tune Registry, which is a music rights administration program. She's in the process of starting a small record label with two business partners, and in her spare time, she's educating and encouraging others to pursue their dreams through her video series, written blogs, speaking engagements, and one-on-one -on -one consultations. Um, you can find her on Instagram. That's probably where you know her from if you are familiar with her and her work. Um, but again, I'm super excited to uh, play our conversation. So without further ado, here is Miss Coakley. And of course, I started out by thanking Patrice for being on the show. Sure, no problem. So, um, I mean, we just read through your bio and there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to uh, just kind of get into your background and let me just understand, you know, who you are and, you know, what brought you here. Yeah, sure. Um, right now I'm in Chicago, but I always tell people that I, I have to recognize home. Born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, whole time. Um, moved out to Chicago about six years ago for uh, a job that I had at the time. Um, but, you know, when I moved out here, the entrepreneurial bug was still biting me, so I decided to jump and take the leap while I was out here in Chicago. And I uh, started the Baseline Group. Well, let me rewind a little bit. Before I started the Baseline Group, I was actually helping out some small businesses and other entrepreneurs with their marketing endeavors and whatnot. Um, but at, during that time, I felt the music industry was still calling me. Um, I was actually a music major when I started college. Um, I played the piano since I was 10. So I was always interested in music. Um, so, you know, I felt like it was time for me to just, you know, switch from working with all kinds of businesses to just focus on music, and I did that um, in 2014. And, um, yeah, everything else kind of fell into place from there. Okay. Yeah. So um, you've always been involved in marketing in, in some form or fashion. but Yes. So let's talk about making that switch to really just, you know, focusing on marketing for musicians. What was it that really caused you to make that switch? Well, I noticed that a lot of well, a lot of artists always gravitated towards me anyway. Um, with my my own personal, um, you know, I love music anyway. So it was like I was always at shows, at concerts, uh, at networking events for you know just music. It was I don't want to say it was a hobby, but it was something I was really passionate for. But um, yeah, it, it came to that point where I said, you know what, I have to feed that passion. Um, right. And then on top of that, it was like. I wanted to be in the music business since I was a child anyway, but since the economy hit, the music industry changed, um, I was kind of stuck in the Midwest. I just felt like it wasn't the time to make that, that transition, mm -hmm. but I'm like, I'm not getting any younger. So I said, it's time for me to just go for it and just go hard at it at the time. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much contributed to it, yeah. Okay. So once you made that switch, um, mm -hmm. how did how did things go? Or what kind of things were you getting into at the beginning? Um, it went well. It went well. I was working with a couple of local artists, uh, small local artists here in Chicago, uh, getting them going under the Baseline Group brand, um, mostly more like PR work. It was a lot of brand development, helping them with their logo, their marketing strategy, helping them with their, their website and bios and things of that nature, just getting their presence um, you know, packaged and, and put out there. And then it transitioned into managing. So I had started working with some artists and managing their careers. And then the deeper I got into it, I started dibbling and dabbling into publishing. So 
that led to my work now with Tune Registry. So now when I consult artists, I look at a whole 360, you know, view of the industry and their brand. I know a lot of people that do similar work. They just focus on marketing, promotion, and, you know, web design and whatnot, whereas I focus on that but also throw in the publishing and making sure that they're set up right because a lot of indie artists, they're not set up, you know, appropriately. So, um, yeah, I take a 360 approach and make sure, you know, we're covered from all angles. Okay. Cool, cool. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to talk about just kind of something you just hit on uh, a second ago. Um, but you said that some people that, that focus on marketing and they focus on websites or design. Um, in your opinion, what is marketing and, you know, how should it relate to a musician? Sure, sure. I think, well, textbook, I mean, the textbook definition is just marketing is just a way, um, just a strategy and a way for you to, to market and promote your your work or whatever it is that you're doing to the public. Um, and then it breaks down into you know, PR or digital marketing and so forth. There's a lot of, you know, subcategories under under marketing, but marketing is the umbrella. But as far as artists go, to me, for an artist, it's just a strategy uh, and a way for you to move, uh, a way for you to, to brand yourself, and a way for you to connect with your audience. And then also knowing who the audience is, too, because a lot of people don't know that. So it starts with knowing your audience and then packaging and delivering what it is that you have in a way that's appealing to that audience. Right. Yeah. Got you. Yeah. You know, I, um, in my book, I write that, you know, I believe marketing is about 75% of all the activity that you're going to take in your music business. Yes, for sure. You know, because it's, it's the, the full process from, you know, you conceiving of an idea and then bringing that finished product to a customer. Right, exactly. Um, and so it's like even when you're just, you know, figuring out, okay, what am I going to post on social media today? Like that's mm-hmm. a form of marketing as well. And I think right. a lot of artists don't take that into account. They see like marketing as, I think a lot of people confuse marketing with advertising. Yes. So it's like people if I don't have, different things. Right. So it's like mm-hmm. if I don't have a project uh, to promote right now, then I'm not really marketing. I'm just going to lay low until the next cycle. Right. That's how we kind of look at things in the music business, or well, at least in the past we have. You know, it's only mm-hmm. recently that now we're, you know, we're looking at social media and we're kind of like this, you know, the 24-hour news cycle. Everything's always on. Every artist wants to be popping all the time. Right. Unless you're like superstar status, then those people might, you know, go dark for a little bit and then come mm-hmm. back out when it's time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But as an indie artist, you got to market all the time. 24-7, right. as, as, I, as I tell tell the artists. I mean, even with us, you and I, we have to market ourselves with our brands all the time. You know, you have your content, the podcast, and then I do my videos on Instagram and some other stuff I have coming up. It's like you have to until we get to that Jay-Z and Beyonce status to where we don't have to do it all the time. But even still, they have people in place to keep their name out there. So, yeah, we, we they, artists, they have to do that. You have to market all the time. There's no off season, right? And so when I have someone who does like consultations or um, works in artist management, I always like to ask, you know, what are the mistakes that you're seeing artists making? Like when they come to you, what is it that they're typically doing wrong, and what do you have to correct to get them on the right track? I think there's a couple of things that they do wrong. Um, basically, I mean, if it, if I take like a whole macro approach to it and, and view on it, I think they're doing everything wrong outside of the studio and recording. But if I was to narrow it down, I would say the two things that they mess up on is, for one, the publishing side of things, not understanding, you know, Harry Fox music reports and you know your BMI, ASCAP, and CSAC and Sound Exchange. There's more to more to it than those companies. A lot of artists, they'll just join ASCAP or BMI and say, hey, I'm done and wash your hands. No, there's more you got to do to it uh, with those accounts to, to get, you know, those royalties. And then the other thing is that they don't know who their audience is. They don't know who they're targeting. Um, it's like they just want to make music and put it out. And that's fine if it's a hobby. But in order to make money, you got to, you know, you got to target somebody. You have to be making music. For somebody, you've got to know that. You know, if it's kids or if it's college students, if it's the the 
a full-time employee that's trying to become an entrepreneur. You have an audience. So it's like I think artists need to know who that is so that way they can, you know, better create – the way they can create the content better in a way that it resonates with them. And then I think, you know, once they have that underway, they'll, you know, be able to see some traction from it. Right. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think it's it's definitely important. Um, I think a lot of indie artists don't look at the music publishing side of things, you know, because we know it works off royalties. Right. right? Traditionally, Mm -hmm. like a mechanical royalty might be less than 10 cents a song. Right. So you're like, okay, if I'm selling all these albums myself or um, maybe I'm not selling any. That's typically the indie artist issue. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm not selling any music. Why would I be concerned with, Why? you know, right. the royalties? Because no, nothing's coming on the front end, so how's mm-hmm. it going to come to the back end, right? Right, um, exactly. You know, but I think what I tell people is, like, you know, what you're doing is you're you're, you're laying the, the framework, right. right? Like every house, you know, you build a foundation, yeah, but then before all the walls can go up, there's framing that's done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can walk in a house and see straight through, but there's all the beams, everything's in place. So it's like, okay, as soon as they come in with a sheetrock, this is going to look like a house. Right. Right. And so exactly. that's that's what I tell artists that the that publishing aspect of it is. You know, you're, you're registering with all these companies, not because you have something that needs to be there right now. Right. But, you know, let's say, like, uh, that guy that did the Panda Beat. Yeah. Let's say he exactly. registered all of that stuff correctly. Uh-huh. Right. Because... Uh-huh. Designer bought that beat for like twenty five dollars or something crazy. Yeah, and was not a known person. So it's like right. that's, that's the typical beat stars transaction that you see now. Yep, right? all the time. Exactly. But what happens when that guy does sign a deal? When mm-hmm. that song sells ten million copies or however many it sells, you know, now it's like okay, now there's definitely something to manage. I've heard this song on TV. It's all mm-hmm. over the radio. It's yep. everywhere. You know, it's on Designer's album and it's on Kanye's album, and I have no idea how I'm going to get my money. Exactly. And then, and then you run into that situation where you feel like, uh, you know, I can't ask them for what I deserve because they're this big company and I'm just me. Huh. But you yeah. should. <laughs> but exactly. you should. You know, right. when um, there was a, a meme that went viral earlier this year, I think it was this year, maybe last year, with um, Jermaine Dupri in it. It was a meme, uh, it was a screen capture from uh, his interview on The Breakfast Club, and they were talking about that. He had said something, and it had gotten people really worked up. And I had did a video on that just letting, you know, producers especially know that they are entitled to royalties, no matter, you know, where you sell it. You're still entitled, entitled to some back-end money. But it's all about negotiating. So it's like even if you are a small time, small-time artist, and you're thinking like, okay, I'm not making enough for that to even matter. You should still be educated on it because you never know. You never know what's going to happen. And then on top of that, if somebody presents a deal to you, you you'll be educated and you and you you won't be taken advantage of, you know, because you know. So that I mean, that's what I try to tell artists. I'm always educating them on that. I mean, even if it's not applicable, at least know and understand it. So when the opportunities do arise, you know how to handle it. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, definitely. Yeah. Um, and so, and then with, going on to the other thing you said about targeting or just, you know, finding your audience, what are some of the steps that you'll kind of walk an artist through to find that audience or understand more about them? Uh, well, I like to hang out with the artists. I mean, my approach is very laid back and chilled. I don't have like a, like there's not like a list of questions I ask them, you know. I'm a very in- intuitive person, Um And I think that was just a gift that I was just born with. Um, I can just, you know, hang out with somebody and read them. Um, So I usually hang out with an artist for about a month or two and really just see how they move, see how they work, go to the studio with them, go have lunch, just hang out. Um, And then I'm able to see what it is that, you know, they want, their desires, but also who would be attracted to it. Um, I think something like that is there's no – there's no questionnaire or data would be able to tell you that type of information. You know, there's no techno, technical, you know, platform that would be able to tell you that without doing it organically and just getting to know someone, you know. So that that's basically my approach. Um, and then I also, I ask them, you know, what are their goals, what it is that they want to achieve. Some artists, they want to blow up. Some artists, they just want to, you know, just make a, 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 a decent living making music, which is fine, you know. 
So um, I think there's a lot of levels to the industry, and it's, it's, it matters just knowing what level they want to be on. So that's pretty much my approach. I just hang out with them, and then we, you know, we talk, and you know, it's like they, we're best buddies for a couple of months, and then we just go from there. Um, and then it's, it's just a matter of identifying those people, um, you know, within the audience that that their content and their music and who they are in general resonate with, and then just reaching them. You know. Got you. Yeah, yeah. I think it, I think it's very important to understand an audience because I think you know there's a lot of different things out there right now. Mm-hmm. You know, there's people that will tell you, you know, the best way to do it is to run Facebook ads. And yeah, there's there are so many different tools out there, and so many people, you know, claim to be experts on certain aspects of the industry. Right. And I think we have this this uh, this thing that where we'll we're always looking for the next thing. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, if this is going to bring me success, let me do that. So one day you're on Facebook ads. The next day you're trying to find the best Instagram hashtags. Mm-hmm. Uh, the next day you're like, oh, I'm going to start a YouTube channel. And then mm-hmm. what happens is like, for most people, they'll bottom out. Yep. It's like, that's not, yep. what I'm, that's not what I'm here for. Yep. You know? Yeah, and then, the right, they get burnt out. And it's just like, I have no idea what to do next. And they they start off, you know, decent, and then they just fall off. And they're like, mm-hmm. now I'm worse than I was when I began. Right. But if you know where your audience is, then it's easier to say, okay, my audience is probably on Instagram because they enjoy X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. And then you can say, all right, I'll be on Instagram, and that's what right. I'm doing for the next eight weeks, nine weeks, whatever it's going to be. Right. And so with that said, I'm looking at your Instagram right now, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering, like, you know, what started you doing these these videos that you're doing? <laughs> um, I've always done videos on and off, but I never was really consistent with it. I can admit that. Um, and that's what I tell artists: be consistent. When you're consistent, things happen. <laughs> things happen like really well. But for me. I said I felt like I needed to do more. Um, I'm the type where I like to stay behind the scenes. This is why it's very rare that you'll see me, like, on panels or things like that, even though I do them. But I like to stay behind the scenes and focus on the work, and I want my artists to get all the face time. I'll get my recognition later. I'm okay with that. Um, Mm. But I've always stayed behind the scenes. But a lot of people say, Patrice, you always... You always have good insight on stuff. My students say that. Everybody says it. So I said, you know what, let me try these little videos and just see what happens. Let me come up with a list of topics. And even that, I strategized. I said, let me come up with I was going to put them out every week, and then I slowed down a little bit because I got sick, the holidays, and some other stuff happened. Um, but I said, let me come up with 17. That was like the remain. That was the number of weeks remaining when I started. Let me come up with 17 topics. I came up with 17 topics. And then I just randomly started, you know, recording videos, editing them, and putting them up. Um, so I'm fairly new at being consistent with it. I still have some now I have to schedule out. But I said, you know, I, I know I need to do more. We live in a world where you have to be visible. As much as I don't like it, us business people, we still have to be visible. So I said, let me try this, see how well it goes. Um, be consistent with it for a couple of months, three months or so, or at least to the end of the year, and then we'll see what happens. And even just before, we're not even at the end of the year yet. I mean, we're not in January, obviously. And I'm just like, whoa, I've gotten a lot of responses from it. Somebody shared it, and then it went viral from there, and I'm just like, oh, my goodness. So, yeah, I just, I just forced myself to be more visible. I mean, people told me, you know, I need to do more, and I know we got to be visible out here, so I just, I just did it. <laughs> that was, that was basically it. Yeah. I, let me tell you, I hate this new like personal branding era. Yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I the reason I went into artist management and consulting was so that I wouldn't have to be you Thank know, in you. front of a camera. Exactly. Right? Like, you shared that video of me the other day, and I was like, I forgot I did that. You forgot you did? (laughs) But it's just like, I hate it, but Mm -hmm. it's necessary, you know. Right, right. You have to be able to put yourself out there. And, you know, people want to know that Mm -hmm. you're someone, you know, whose opinion they can trust. Exactly. Right. 
Exactly. And because there are so many people, like, fly by night, they might read one book or one blog post or something. And, then and they know, and they're not they're experts, right, and now they're experts. I hate that. Right. You know, that was another thing, imposter syndrome, mm-hmm. feeling like I didn't know enough. I'm not credible enough. But right. it, it, it took me sitting down looking at all the stuff I've done, the people I've worked with, who I'm affiliated with, and all of that. And I said, you know what, Patrice, I don't think you can get even any more credible than this to do a video. <laughs> <You know>? Right. <laughs> right. And it's funny, like, with, with, like, on the same token as the imposter syndrome, it's also like, you know, you never want to come off like you're, you're bragging. Or, exactly. Right. You know, so it's like, yeah. it's like okay, well, I worked with X, Y, Z artists. Mm-hmm. And I've seen people sell this many records, and, all, and it's just like that's not what I'm in it. It's a turn off. Yeah, it's right. a turn off. It, mm-hmm. Well, it's a turn off to us. Yeah. But I've noticed that for everyone else, it's like okay, now I can trust this person. It's great. Right. They stop it up. Yep. They stop it up big time. Yep. Yeah. So it's like mm-hmm. me trying to navigate this space is, is very interesting. Yeah. Um, and it's a big part of the reason I started the podcast because it's like mm-hmm. as much as I know we have to put ourselves out there. I want to give the spotlight to other people. Exactly. Right? And, you right. know, my my goal is, you know, if we can reach artists, if we can reach the next generation of kids, especially, you know, for us as minorities, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't know these jobs exist. Right. You know, All they know is the artist. That's it. Being an artist. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so I started this to kind of give them that awareness and show them, hey, you can, if you like being on tour, you don't have to be the artist. You can be the tour manager. Right. You can plan this. You can set this up. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be the one that makes all this happen. There's so many other avenues out there. But, yeah, this 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 new Instagram generation is interesting. It is. It is. <laughs> Very much so. You're not alone over there. <laughs> cool, cool. So um, I want to talk about Tune Registry, and we're kind of jumping around, but I think this is just a fun conversation. Yeah, um, that's fine. So what is Tune Registry, and why do you feel like the work that you guys are doing there is important? Man, Tune Registry is just dope. Let me just say that. <laughs> um, it's a platform. It's a music uh, rights administration platform that allows an artist to register their music to all of these different music organizations at once. Now, I just learned of this platform earlier this year. And managing artists, I was managing three artists at the time. And it was a hassle, even for me, to log into BMI. Register all their music there. Log in to ASCAP for this one. Register their music there. Okay, now let me go to Sound Exchange. Do the same over there. Oh, there's Music Reports and Harry Fox and Louder and all these other platforms that you have to go in individually. Tune Registry takes that, like it takes the guesswork and all of that work out of it, out the equation. Mm-hmm. You log into Tune Registry. Um, you input in all of your song details, you know, down to the full, like the full split sheet. You put that in there. There's even a spot where you can add the audio file. You can uh, document the recording and the release of the project. You have every, all that information there, and then all you have to do is click one button to submit it to your PRO, um, to the uh, the other U.S. Uh, song registrations, and, and as well as uh, the release and the recording registrations as well just by hitting a couple of buttons, and that's it, as opposed to logging in to each individual network. So I've been working with them for um, a couple of months, and, um, yeah, I love it. I love the work that we're doing. We focus more so on educating the artist. It's not about, okay, we have this tool. It's the only tool out here that's doing this for you. Um, But let me educate you at the same time, you know, and there's a lot of, music um, publishing administrators out there already. There's like Song Trust and uh, TuneCorn, CD Baby. They offer the service as well, but they take a commission from whatever they collect. It's usually 15 20%. The right. good thing with us at Tune Registry is that we don't take a commission. All you do is just pay your subscription, which is like 15 bucks a month. We have different tiers of subscriptions, um, but the lowest is 15 bucks a month, and that's it. All of the royalties come directly to you. We don't collect anything. We're just a platform to, to help you in this process. And that's it. So even with that, a lot of artists are saving a lot of money um, just from us not taking a commission and just being subscription-based. So, yeah, my time with them has been has been fun thus far. Um, 
I also host a webinar twice a week, uh, just showing people, you know, just going through a live demo so that way they can get a look and a feel of how the, the platform works. That's on Monday and Thursdays. So if anyone's listening and want to check it out, you can certainly register for it at TuneRegistry.com. And, um, yeah, we do it twice a week. So it's, uh, we're doing some good work and yeah, we're, we're constantly growing. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm mm-hmm. looking over, um, the Tune Registry website now. I did not know a service existed to do all of that registration at once. That would yeah, save exactly. a lot of people a lot of time. Thank you. I mean, you. If, <laughs> you know, exactly. if, you, if you're someone who's running a staff, you know, a lot of music publishers are running a staff whose job is just to rest of those songs, you know. Yeah. This is saving you those billable hours. And so that that is a great service. Exactly. And that's what I said when I learned of it. And I'm not just saying it because I work, work there, but, man, I was a fan before I even worked there. And when I saw that they were looking to build the team, I'm like, hey, I love what y'all doing. Let me, let me, <laughs> let me come on board and help. So, um, yeah, it certainly saves a lot of time. And not only that, um, we also deliver the music to some of the uh, – um, the metadata and music discovery platforms too, like your TiVo and Louder and all of those other platforms. We deliver the music there. So if Grace Note, them too. I mean, we have over 20 networks of, uh, uh, music organizations, uh, that we submit this data to. So if you're talking, you know, like you're in your car and you got an app on your phone and you're looking for a song, your music will be there, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think little stuff like that, is the part that a lot of artists are missing out on. All they know is ASCAP, BMI, and Sound Exchange, and some of them aren't even registered with Sound Exchange. So it's like not only do we deliver to them, but we also cover these other mechanical royalties um, and these music metadata delivery services and discovery services as well to make sure your music is covered all the way around. Got you. Mm-hmm. Now, I know you guys register the the – music with those different services, but now are the royalties filtering back through you guys? Not at all. Or are they all. paid out by the, the different yep. providers? Yep, they're paid out directly to the artists from those those uh, providers. We don't touch anything. Okay. That's the, yep, that's the good thing about it, whereas, you know, TuneCore and SongTrust and all of them, they touch it. They collect for you, and then they take 20% off top. Like, right. you can, they, you could, they could collect $10,000 for you, and then they're going to take their 2000 Mm-hmm. Whereas us, you collect ten thousand um, dollars. Well, you have ten thousand, ten thousand in income that goes directly to you, and all you paying us is the fifteen dollars subscription every month, and that's it. Got you. Yep, it goes directly to you. So, in order to use Clean Registry, though, you do have to go to these networks and make sure that you have uh, your account set up. You know, so make sure you you join BMI or ASCAP and Sound Exchange and so forth. But as far as the ongoing maintenance and submitting your music, all that's done through Tune Registry. So basically, you only need to contact or log into those accounts just once, really, to set up your account, give them all your payment information, you know, with BMI and ASCAP and so forth, and then go into Tune Registry to submit your music. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool, cool. Now, with this being a monthly charge, um, I guess – to play the devil's advocate, so to speak. Mm-hmm. The, I think the biggest issue I see with it, or I shouldn't say big, but an issue that I could see coming up is, you know, with a lot of these services, especially with ASCAP and BMI, you know, it'll take nine months, you know, to get a royalty from the day you uh, put out a song. And that's assuming, mm-hmm. you know, it gets any traction or whatever, right? right? And so if you're paying out fifteen, thirty, forty dollars $40 a month, it could take you a while to recoup that. And so I do say, I do believe that, you know, obviously this is a great service, right? But mm-hmm. I think it it seems like it's more tailored to someone who's kind of gotten their stuff together already. They've, they've kind of gotten uh, some business flowing. They've got a cash flow. Uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, it. right, right, right. I would say, yep, I totally get what you're saying. But to me, I feel like if you're an artist, your goal is, is to be able to make ten, fifteen dollars a month. If you're an artist, there's no way you can't make fifteen dollars a month. Come on, now. if right. you're if you're doing it right. Um, but it also depends on you know how many songs they're putting out, what they're doing. I mean, you're gonna have to wait months regardless. You sure. know, if you use Tune Registry or not. 
we're just saving you the time of registering your music because there's a lot of maintenance behind it. Not only are you submitting songs, and if you're an artist that's putting out or creating five, six songs a, a week, and there's artists that's doing more than that, that's a lot of time spent registering all that stuff. You right. know? And then on top of that, you know, you have to get all the splits done, and then on top of that, you have to go into each network to register that same song multiple times. Mm-hmm. So I get what you're saying as far as the savings, but I feel like you'll be able to make that $15 back in other ways until – it pays off per se. You know, right. now, yeah, using tune registry, we done freed you up, like you said, you know, the billable hours. But as an artist, we're saving you so much more time. That's true. Because the other, mm-hmm. the, on the flip side of that is most artists, uh, you know, if they're just starting out, they're doing this themselves. They may not even have yeah. a manager. Exactly. You know, and I think that's one of the, this is one of the services that kind of takes that stress off of them. Right. Because, you, know, right. you know, the biggest complaint I get or, you know, I get people in my inbox like, oh, can you be my manager? I'm like, I've never met you before. You mm-hmm. live on the other side of the world. It doesn't make sense, right? Mm-hmm. But it's like so many artists feel like they need a manager because they're overwhelmed with all the different That's tasks basically that it. On. Exactly. Exactly. You know? That's what and it is. It's a lot of work. Yeah. So this is definitely something that, you know, saves you that time, mm-hmm. saves you that headache. You don't have to worry about if it was done correctly and it can, you can get back to tuning your guitar or whatever it is that you're doing exactly. to hone in on your craft, you know. Right, right. Um, rehearsing for a show. I mean, you do one show, you know, even if it's one of those like, oh, let me sell 10 tickets to this show, that's that $15 right there. Yeah. So one one ticket to a show, that could be the $15. Yeah. Right. For sure. So you're not going to make it back directly, you know, per se, but there's other ways you can make that back, you know, what they call it, the opportunity cost, you know. There's exactly. a yeah, there's that cost uh, associated with your time, you know. Right. So yeah, I feel like you would make that fifteen back with time spent doing something else. Definitely. I mean, I think mm-hmm. for 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 most artists, mm-hmm. um, especially with the amount of services that you guys are registering the music with, let's say it does take that nine to twelve months to get the first check from whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Let's say you had one song that may have gotten placed on. A TV show or yeah. not something that's so big, right? But there are so many little small opportunities that come around yes, that people sure. don't know about. Mm-hmm. But let's just say one of your songs got like a bigger opportunity. That's that. I mean, you'll make up the whole cost of that year of the service. Yeah, your first royalty check and probably more. Okay. <laughs> and, yeah, and probably more. Right, right. So I think you know. I think it, it's it's still. I I think our cost though, our price point is still reasonable for artists. I mean, I spend 15 bucks a month just for a social media platform I use to schedule my posts, you know. Yeah. I'm not making any money in that, per se. There's no royalty check with that, but it is saving me time. Right. You it's, know? Just, it's the cost of doing business. Basically. And that's what I, that's the message I really want to get to artists, though, is that as, as an artist, if your goal is to make money, you're going to have to spend it. And it's mm-hmm. because it is a business, and a lot of artists, that's another mistake. <laughs> they don't see themselves as businesses, but that's essentially what you are. So you have right. to spend money in order to make money. Right. Yeah, as soon mm-hmm. as you come up with your stage name, that's like putting the sign on the door. That's it. Um, that's your I'm business name. Business. Exactly. Right. Yep. Yep, for sure. Cool. So I, I want to talk about your teaching career mm-hmm. and – you know, what, what inspired you to get involved in the business on that way where you're affecting people every day and teaching things that day in and day out? Uh, well, I've always been an educator in some kind of way, shape, or form. Um, anytime I learn something, I always want to give that information out. So educating has always came, nat- it always came natural to me. Um, it wasn't until uh, when I moved here, um, I was, like, in between jobs. I was going through stuff, and I was like, all right, let me do the music thing. But then I felt like I needed to do more. I hosted a couple of workshops on my own just to test it out, and I enjoyed it. I'm like, oh, this is cool. This is dope. But I was at a networking event, and one of the, the career services uh, reps for that school was there, and I had a conversation with him, just a general, regular conversation. Um, really cool, right? And that was it. A couple of months down the line, um, 
the music business department chair he posted on his Facebook. Um, and I was friends with him on Facebook, not because of the school, but because, you know, mutual acquaintances and whatnot. And he said, hey, um, as you guys know, I'm the department chair of this school. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I didn't know that at the time. I'm like, whoa. And he said, we're looking for um, instructors for this class. We're trying to re-image the class and do this, y, X, Y, and Z. And I said, I do that now. <laughs> I do that now with clients and artists and whatnot. So I slid in his inbox on Facebook and said, this is how I would do it because I do this now. And he said, cool, you want to come in and, and talk? Sure. I go there. I saw the guy that I met at the, at the networking event. We talked, and then it just kind of fell into place like that. It wasn't something that I was seeking, but it just fell into place. It was kind of like I felt like God was lining me up for that opportunity because, I, as I said, I was a, I'm always educating people on whatever it is. And just for that to happen, it was kind of like just divine in a sense. Right. And so now that you're in it, um, what are some of the things that you love about it? Uh, the fact that I can help the younger generation. Mm -hmm. I, I pride myself on being the person that I wish I had at that age. So I'm the mentor, uh, the guidance counselor per se, um, even some of the students that's graduated, I still help them to this day. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I love that. The fact that the music business is hard. It's not, even though it's, even though artists and these celebrities make it seem easy, it mm -hmm. is a hard industry. There's really no rules and regulations to this. There's right. no, yes, there's books. And you know, you know, you have a book and there's, um, the the book uh, from Passman, you know, everyone knows about that book. Yeah, there's stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, there's no, no, there's not a degree. You don't need a degree or some so sort of credential to be in the music industry. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's kind of like the wild, wild west. And then on yeah. top of that, you have the negative side of it where since it's the wild, wild west, you got a lot of bad crooks in there too. Mm -hmm. So I felt like if anything, what the industry needs is mentors and people willing to help, people willing to give information, and that's what I wanted to be, you know. So I did that at school, and I still do that even outside of teaching. So, I mean, that's basically what I enjoy about it, and, you know, I pride myself on that, just being able to, to help and be what I didn't have and what I wished I had when I was in my early to mid-20s. Right. Mm hmm yeah, I think it's, yeah, the, like you said, the music business is, it's weird because there's, there's frameworks, right? There's certain mm -hmm. things, like there's, there's set royalties, there's certain companies that we know, okay, these are the establishment. Right. Right. But things change so quickly. Mm, all like, the time. You know, when I was in, when I was an undergrad, I had to do a report on the music industry, mm -hmm. and at the time it was still the big four labels. Right. right? <laughs> now EMI doesn't exist. Right. And it's the big three. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in my master's program for music business, mm -hmm. we were learning all about, uh, what was it, Top Spin. Mm. And, you know, the how great their direct-to-fan platform was and all that, yeah. right? Yep. Mid-semester, Beats Music buys Top Spin, and then a year later, Apple Music bought Beats. Oh. And Top Spin still exists, but it's mm -hmm. just like, it's kind of in this limbo state. So exactly. There are so many companies that have come and gone. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that have come and gone. Mm -hmm. And so it's like we're I feel like the music industry is one of those where it's like we're constantly studying to have to stay current. Exactly. Yes. You know, and I think yeah. technology changes, you know, across the board. All the time. But like, you know, but with music it's just it's different. Like the, mm -hmm. the royalty companies, the royalty boards change. The music the, modernization. Distribution act. companies change. Yep. Distribution that, yep. companies change. Mm -hmm. Everything changes so often. And so it's like if you're not willing to learn on a daily basis, you're going to get left behind. Exactly. And I think with all that said, it's super important to have people like you who are, you know, committed to mm -hmm. doing that daily work, to right. learning what's out there, to staying abreast of, you know, all the new changes, and then being able to process and communicate that information to artists who are, you know, relying on you for it. Exactly, exactly. I have a link now. I woke up this morning still laying in bed, haven't rolled over barely. I'm looking, researching stuff. Just in the bed this morning and came across a, a really good article 
um, about uh, some information I was sharing with a with a former student slash possible potential client, <laughs> mm-hmm. and I copied the link and I was gonna send it to him, but I'm like it's too early, so it's just sitting in drafts for me to send to him a little later. But yeah, I mean I'm always reading stuff, and I feel like you have to, you have mm-hmm. to nowadays with everything that's going on. So if I learn something, I'm so open to sharing it. You know, I do it on a daily basis all the time. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that's how I came across you. I think that's, yeah. that's amazing. I appreciate um, it. Oh, no problem. And so I want to jump into kind of a lightning round um, before we wrap up. And so mm-hmm. who's your favorite artist? Ooh, Michael Jackson. <laughs> okay. Why Michael <laughs> Jackson? Man, I grew up with him. Like, I grew up on his, not with him, but with his music. Like, mm-hmm. um, I well, not only that, you know, he's a Virgo like me, but I like the fact that he was always himself, no matter what. And on top of that, he was super, extremely talented. And, I mean, he's just like childhood, you know, so... Yeah, that's why I say Michael Jackson. I mean, he's a Virgo, and he's like the king. I think he will always be the king. There will be no one else that can top him. Cool, cool. Yeah. Uh, who's your biggest inspiration? Oh. Hmm. Biggest? Uh, you know, I'm inspired by a lot of people. I, I really don't have, like, one that I would say is the biggest. I'm, I'm inspired by, you know... Like Beyonce, Jay Z, even her dad, Matthew Knowles, um, music business people, uh, Jimmy Irene and Kevin Lyles, uh, even Russell Simmons. I mean, I think, yeah, I'm inspired by a lot of people. Oprah. I mean, I think anybody that's overcame adversity mm-hmm. who, who are now successful, I'm inspired by it. And they're still facing that same adversity, but, you know, they let it, you know, roll off their shoulders. They're still killing it. I'm inspired by that. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, since you mentioned Matthew Knowles, I know you've done some work with him in the past. Um, through your, you guys' time together, what would you say is the biggest lesson you learned or the biggest, yeah, I guess your biggest takeaway from your experience with him? Oh, my God, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, the biggest thing I would say that I learned from him is know your worth. Is to know your worth because um I had landed him as a client during a very low period in business. This was in 2018, so this was about two and a half years ago. Yeah. And I was experiencing a very low period in business to where I reached out to him just for mentorship and guidance. I was on YouTube and I just went into a, a YouTube funnel of videos on him and I said you know let me find this man's email and just shoot him an email and I did and he replied back with um, an opportunity and he's been or he was the best client I've ever had from big to small the best client Um, despite what the media says about him I have no issues with that man whatsoever Um, he taught me to know my worth because I've worked with smaller artists, and I felt like there were times where I wasn't valued, you know. Mm -hmm. But here I am working with this this veteran, this legend, living legend in the industry. And he would say, Patrice, I want to know what you think, what you think we should do. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. whoa, this man asking me for my opinion and then actually taking my advice and implementing it. But yet here I am working with smaller artists that's paying little to nothing, and they're not listening to me. So I was like, whoa. (laughs) Just from that dynamic Mm -hmm. during those two years of me working with him, that change, that difference, it was just polar opposite, you know, ends of the spectrum. So I said, you know what, That's, that's what I learned the most from him was to know my worth. If this man that's been through so much and has seen the industry inside and out, upside down and backwards, is respecting me, then these little artists, smaller artists, up and coming artists should respect me as well. And not only that, I need to value and know my worth because right. I obviously I have something. So that's what I learned from him. I mean, uh, yeah, and I, I I always talk about that. Like it was a, a really good experience. That sounds dope. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, let's see. Yeah. So next uh, question. 
what do you feel that artists need to know about the music industry? Uh, that it doesn't happen overnight. And you have to be super committed and consistent. Just like a baby, right? You have to wake up, feed the baby, change the baby diaper. You can't let the baby over there and just let the baby live its life. No. You have to be super consistent with it, no matter what's going on in your life. Right. You know? So I think that's something that I, I would love artists to understand. They can be consistent with it and take it seriously and then also remain open to learning and accepting constructive criticism, they'll be fine. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to ask you the reverse. What do you wish the music industry in general or as a whole understood more about the artists? Um, that there's talent out here that needs recognition and needs to be put on. Um, I think... I feel like right now we're we're in a time where it's all about the gimmicks and the cartoon characters and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of artists that are super talented right now. I share a lot of them even on my social media that I feel like they need some recognition. They need to be known and written about, and they have stories to tell as well. Um, I wish the music business respected talent more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, I mean, you're kind of just getting started. I don't mean to say that in a disrespect, disrespectful way, mm -hmm. but I know you've got way more ahead of you than yeah. behind you, right? Yeah. And yeah. so when it's all said and done, what would you like your mark to be on the industry? Um, hmm. Good question. You know, I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I think right now, I don't know if I want to have a mark on the industry per se, mm -hmm. but I want to have a mark on artists. I want to, yeah, I want to have a mark on artists, and then they can go out and put a mark on, on the industry. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool. So mm -hmm. um, for artists who are interested in working with you and, you know, uh, hearing more about your consultations and things like that, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, the best way is my website, the Baseline Group, that's B-A-S-S-L-I-N-E group dot com. Or they can hit me up on social media. Um, my name is on all social media, Patrice K. Copley, C-O-K-L-E-Y, or the Baseline G-R-P, either or. Um, I'm, I watch all of them. Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, I will definitely make sure I leave a link to all that in the show notes. And is there any uh, parting advice or wisdom that you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, just don't give up. You know, it's it's hard. It's a, a rough industry. Um, some of these celebrities, it took them years before we even heard of them. So if it's something that you really want to do, you're passionate about, don't give up and make sure you value and, um, you know, appreciate and respect the people that's helping you out. Got you. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Well, I think that is the perfect note to end on. Patrice, thank you so cool. much. Uh, for joining us and for speaking to our audience and being so sure. candid about your experiences. Oh, no problem. Thanks so much for having me, Brandon. It was my pleasure as always. So that's going to wrap up today's podcast. Uh, I'm super grateful to Patrice for coming and, you know, sharing her experience with us. Uh, so please, uh, there are major keys there. So please uh, make sure you keep up with Patrice. Uh, she's on Instagram at Patrice K. Coakley. Uh, you can find her at PatriceKCoakley.com um, and take her up on that offer. Uh, she's doing great work. Uh, so follow her on all her social media and stay connected. Uh, so again, if you guys are interested in that group coaching program, then Check out the link in our show notes, kdmr.us slash next steps. Let's start off 2019 the right way. Um, other than that, I will see you guys on the next episode one week from today. Peace.